When it comes to self-custody, a hardware wallet is a really quick and easy way to significantly boost the security of your setup. But the thing is, hardware wallets aren't magic. You don't have to just buy one from a retailer, and there are actually a number of different ways where you can build one yourself. And whether you're someone who's after increased privacy, whether you're someone who is wanting to decrease the trust they're placing in a vendor and their supply chain, whether you're someone who might be in a place where it's difficult to get hardware wallets, or you're just someone who likes to tinker. You know, there are a variety of reasons why DI DIY can be a fantastic solution. But with all of the different DIY options that I've looked at, where do you even start? So in this video, I'm just going to run through a number of DIY self-custody projects that have been around over the years, many of which I have done videos on in the past. I'm going to talk a little bit about their relative strengths and weaknesses. And the other thing I'll refer to a little bit as I go is a new page that I put on my website, which is DIY wallet comparisons. And uh, we'll basically just be going through some of these. So let's get into it. And if you haven't already done so, hit subscribe, that way you can stay in the loop for content I make to help you find your way in the crazy and often hostile environment that is cryptocurrency. Sometimes people ask me in the comment section or other places which DIY project is the best, and uh, the only answer I'll really give to that is it depends. It's like asking a parent to you know, choose their favorite child. So basically in this video, I'll just be going through things in alphabetical order just to keep things fair. And uh, basically if there's a particular project you want some thoughts on, just uh, have a look in the uh, navigation bar at the bottom of the video. There are chapter markers for each different project. So right, in terms of alphabetical order, the first thing we'll talk about is the Jade and the Jade Plus. So basically for the normal Jade, I've got an M5 Stick C Plus 2 here, which is a nice one. And for the Jade Plus, I've got the uh, Lilygo T-Display S3 Pro. And this little M5 Stick one does not have a camera, whereas this T-Display Pro absolutely does. And basically for the Jade, I've basically said that the hardware assembly process for both of these DIY options is ready-made in the pretty much just take these devices out of the box and they are ready to go. No assembly, no soldering, no nothing. And in terms of software setup, one of the things that Jade really has going for it in terms of DIY is that you can actually just flash it using your web browser. There is no additional software installation required at all. And it's important to say that to lock your Jade down and to turn on things like Secure Boot, uh, it is a bit more of an advanced process. I do run through that in my other videos, but you know there are plenty of people who are quite happy just to use uh, their Jade, uh, just flashed as you would do it in the browser. I also have mentioned that the usage complexity for these Jade devices is easy. And the key reason for this is that with these Jade devices, once you flash the DIY firmware on there, they will behave basically just like a retail Jade, meaning that you can use all of the vendor supplied software. Any documentation that's been written for Jade uh, will pretty much just work for your DIY device. So yeah, just plug it in over USB, Bluetooth, desktop, mobile app, any of that with Jade, and it will just work just like a retail Jade. So yeah, definitely very easy to use. I've mentioned the hardware security for these devices is high, and basically that is because if you do the extra steps of enabling secure boot and flash encryption, uh, you basically get the level of security of a retail Jade. And just like retail Jade devices, all of the seed material on the device itself is actually encrypted and protected by a blind pin server, which is a very clever option that uh, Blockstream came up with for their Jades. So next one I've got here is my oversized keep key. Uh, though the assembly difficulty for this one is hard, you will actually need to get a development board and sort of solder all the wires in and solder it together. And flashing the firmware for these is not really straightforward either. You'll have to build that firmware and flash it on there. That said, once you get the thing built, the usage complexity is actually the same as any retail keep key. And the other thing that's interesting about this DIY keep key is it's actually running retail keep key firmware, which means that I can actually just use the official keep key app to be able to update the firmware on this device just like a retail device. And just like with the Jade, you can use it with the vendor supplied software. And I've said here the hardware security is medium because you can lock down the uh, bootloader on this device, though there are key extraction uh, attacks that have been demonstrated for these older uh, hardware devices. And the DIY keep key is, of course, going to be susceptible to those as well. I'll come back to Keyflint a bit later just because it is really still in alpha. Uh, and the next one we'll look at is Crux. And Crux is another one where the assembly difficulty is easy. And the process for actually setting it up to use is simply one of taking it out of the box and flashing the firmware onto the device. And I've done a few videos on this in the past, but this process is actually now much simpler due to Crux installer, which I can just download and verify off the Crux GitHub. I can select the model of device I have. This one here is actually called the Yaboom. 
and basically I can just say I want to flash the firmware. I've already used Crux Installer on this system before, so the files are already there. It'll actually just run through the verification and the flashing process for me. And there we go. So it is as simple as that. Now, the other interesting thing with Crux is I've actually listed its hardware security as media. Although the K210 devices do not have any ability to lock down the bootloader, basically if we go into settings, security, it actually has these new features called tamper check code and TC flash hash. So what I can do is I can just set a pin. And so I set the code and this process will actually take a while because what it's going to do is fill all of the empty flash space on the device itself with entropy from the camera. And there we go. And basically what we can do now is we can say TC, so that's tamper check flash hash at boot, enable yes. And so basically what we have here is anti-tamper words and an anti-tamper sort of icon. So now if I unplug the device and plug it back in, it'll boot. Then I have to enter my tamper check code. And if I type in the correct pin, it gives me the same anti-tamper icon and the same anti-tamper words, letting me know that the flash memory on this device has not changed. And the important thing to understand here is this is not tamper protection like you would have on uh, devices where the hardware natively supports this, but it is an easy way that you can have a tamper check. The other thing I have, I'll mention is I have listed the usage complexity of Crux as advanced. This is definitely more complicated than USB ones where you just plug in and work. Transactions are shared between the device and your computer using either camera or micro SD cards. And the interface on Crux is more powerful than something like Seed Signer, but that brings with it increased complexity, uh, which some users definitely do find uh, less accessible than something like Seed Signer. Now, the next one I'll quickly mention is Pi Trezor. And basically this here is actually an original uh, Raspberry Pi 1A running Pi Trezor. And uh, I did a video on this one ages back. You know, basically this is uh, reasonably cheap. The assembly difficulty is quite straightforward. It's mostly just press fit. Like obviously I've got a custom hat that I made for this, but you can just do it with all press fit components and a Raspberry Pi Zero. The important thing to understand with Pi Trezor is the hardware security is low. Uh, it basically is just running on a Raspberry Pi. The system image all just lives on an SD card and it is connecting over USB. That said, Pi Trezor is easy to use as you can just use it with Trezor Suite exactly like a Trezor One. So the important thing to understand is Trezor Suite will actually throw a warning saying you've got an unofficial device that might have been tampered with. And if you get that message, you will need to go into the device settings in Trezor Suite and just turn off the firmware authenticity check because you know obviously this is not an authentic Trezor. Pi Trezor is definitely the lowest security option that I have here though it is easy to assemble it is easy to use and the parts for it are commonly available so you know it can be particularly good uh, for like recovery situations where you might not have access to a Trezor but want to be able to use that uh, or have difficulty getting the parts but still want something that's sort of simple easy to use and uh, has you know excellent plausible deniability in terms of what you're actually using the hardware for. So the next one I will mention is Sato chip, it is a very simple smart card based option. In terms of hardware assembly, it is easy in that it's just a smart card, you know, there's no assembly required. The main challenge with smart cards is actually sourcing uh, decent ones. Uh, you can get them on places like the Sato chip store, on my store, though anything you're going to find like AliExpress, Amazon or whatever is going to be quite hit and miss. As far as ease of use goes, I'd say Sato chip is medium in that there is not uh, vendor supplied software that, you know, just works. Uh, but yeah, overall it works really nicely with Sparrow, so that's very good. So the key thing to understand is if you're using a PC to initialize this, obviously the seed is not cold from the beginning, though my modified book of Seed Signer that I'll talk about a bit later does allow you to actually both flash the applet onto these quite easily as well as securely initialize them just using the Seed Signer. But this is also a blind signer. So, you know, very useful for smaller amounts or as part of a multi-sig setup, uh, but definitely not gonna give you the same level of security in terms of spending and using it. Uh, compared to a device with a screen. And the final thing to mention here is the hardware security of this DIY option itself is very high, given that everything lives on the smart card, all of the transaction signing, all of that happens within the uh, smart card, which is basically a low cost secure element. All right, so the next one is Seed Signer. And I've actually got Seed Signer listed twice, uh, both the official version of Seed Signer, as well as the fork that I've got that adds the ability to store seeds on the smart cards, uh, and eventually add the ability to do the signing on the smart card as well. I've listed the Raspberry Pi assembly difficulty as medium and it's not as easy as something like you know Jade where it just comes fully assembled ready to go. Uh, you will need to source 
all of the components and stick it together. And some people also will end up sourcing a Raspberry Pi that does not have the pin header soldered and will run into trouble uh, soldering on the pin header. But for the most part, uh, it's definitely quite manageable. Everything is sort of just, you know, press fit goes together and that just works. And while the assembly was pretty involved, my previous video on Seed Signer Plus smart cards, I've actually got a smart card based hat in the pipeline that is again just a press fit and just goes in between the hat and the display hat and the Raspberry Pi board and just sort of goes together like that for a full size card reader. Uh, or if you want something really small and low profile, uh, you can just have something like that for a SIM sized smart card. For the same reason I mentioned earlier for SATA chip, I put Seed Signer down as medium in terms of ease of use in that there isn't just sort of plug and play retail software that you can use it with like something like Jade or something else like that. Though the user interface is simpler than something like Crux. I've listed the physical security as low in that you need to consider that even with stateless operation, there's still no protection of the firmware whatsoever. Basically with something like this, you really want to be fully verifying the firmware image and flashing it like almost immediately uh, before you use the device. Connectivity for this one is via QR code only. So it is good uh, for smaller transactions, but for large and complex transactions, it's definitely going to be quite painful. All right, so the next one to look at is Spectre DIY and Spectre Shield. And again, this one uh, can come in two variants depending on whether you want uh, smart card based seed storage uh, or not. Um, so I've got the Spectre DIY and the Spectre Shield. The assembly difficulty for these is very similar to Seed Signer in that it's basically, you know, everything is press fit, uh, plug and play sort of thing. And the other thing is that actually flashing the firmware onto here for Spectre is quite straightforward as well. You basically just drag and drop a file onto there, just like a USB stick. The process of both assembling and flashing the firmware onto here is very straightforward. I do think that generally the interface on Spectre DIY is similar to Crux in that it is a bit more complicated than something like Seed Signer. Uh, the connectivity for both Spectre Shield and Spectre DIY is very good in that you have you know QR code options, micro SD based options, and you can also connect it over USB for things like Liana or Spectre Desktop. And in terms of the hardware security, I put it down as high in that it has secure boot that is you know turned on by by default and in addition to the device itself being locked down you can also secure the secrets on a smart card itself uh, which does work really nicely with uh, Spectre DIY. I'll talk about status key card at the end and the uh, next one I will mention is the Trezor one and uh, just like the keep key this one definitely goes into the hard category you will need to do uh, soldering for this uh, and hardware security is medium in that you can actually lock this down and run the official stock Trezor one firmware on your DIY device. And the great thing about that, just like the Keep Key, is you can actually use it with Trezor Suite. Though unlike Pi Trezor, uh, because this is running the official stock firmware, we can even go in here and turn the firmware authenticity checks on, and it will still be happy that I have what Trezor Suite considers to be a genuine Trezor. And just like with Keep Key, we can even use Trezor Suite to do a firmware update on my DIY device. And there we go, working just like a stock Trezor. So just like the Keep Key, it is more work in terms of physically building the device. That said, it's easier to get the stock bootloader and official firmware for Trezor and flash that onto your DIY device so that you can be running stock firmware. Uh, and again, once you've got it, it is really easy to use and works just like a retail Trezor one. So the question of how long Trezor continues to support the Trezor One is anyone's guess. So those are all the different DIY options that I've done videos for that I think are viable options to use uh, as of today, depending on your requirements, depending on what parts you can source, uh, your budget and your level of technical uh, ability, or at least your willingness to try things and learn. So what I wanna look at now is some other things that are sort of more in the pipeline uh, and uh, I'm still keen to look at in the coming uh, weeks or months, depending on how their development goes. So the first thing I'll mention is Keyflint. Basically, this is a project that is pretty much just running it all in Arduino. It's still very much what I would consider to be alpha in that you know it doesn't like have a proper case, doesn't have a small uh, low profile serial reader. It's just you know reading continuously and going from there. Uh, it can actually create seeds. And you know we do have the ability to do things like add more entropy. Um, and basically it does allow us to do things like you know, view addresses and stuff like that. But you know, definitely very basic uh, in terms of user interface uh, and things like that. In terms of the hardware assembly, like at least this panel is pretty straightforward. You know, this hardware for this one is basically a Crow Panel ESP32, uh, compatible 
serial readers are a bit of a different story. They're a bit harder to source. And the actual firmware that runs on the device, you need to build that from source. Uh, so not nearly as straightforward as any of the other things. Um, the hardware security for this is low, even though this is an ESP32 board, just like the uh, Jade, uh, because it's doing using the Arduino stack, it's not as straightforward to lock the hardware down and use things like flash encryption and secure boot. Very easy to reflash malicious firmware over the top of this device. And as a user, you would not know that it happened. And the last one I'll quickly talk about is the status key card in that it is very similar to Sato chip in a lot of ways. You know, it just uses exactly the same sort of smart card. And basically it is just a blind sign that can be used uh, with some Android based Ethereum apps as of right now. So the thing about it that I actually find interesting is just a few days ago, they released information about this key card shell, which will actually add air gapped functionality to the device and allow you to use it with things like MetaMask, Blue Wallet, Sparrow, Spectre, and so on. And the reason why this is interesting is that they've actually added both the hardware and the software for this device onto their GitHub. So uh, definitely something I'll have to have a look at in the coming weeks and months. So there you go, that's a bit of an overview of some of the different DIY options that are available. And you know, there's a whole range of different things for different price points, different levels of features, uh, as well as using different hardware and software platforms, depending on what might be available to you, or if you're looking on the development side of things, you know, what you might find interesting to work on and expand. To be really clear, DIY is not for everyone, but I do think it is very important that people can uh, find the information to be able to use readily available off the shelf components to be able to build uh, secure, hardware for their self custody. I think it's important that projects like this exist and I think it's fantastic uh, that we've seen uh, a range of different DIY options uh, having different communities gather around them over the last couple of years. So uh, definitely a great thing to see and I hope that it continues. If there are any DIY projects that I have missed that you think would be good to give some attention to, definitely leave a reply in the comment section. Likewise, if you've tried your hand at any of the projects here and have any thoughts about them, uh, definitely just leave a reply in the comment section, I do my best to reply to all of them. Other than that, stay safe. Thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Hit like if you think that other people would find this video useful and hit subscribe if you'd like to be kept in the loop about future content I make that helps people stay safe in the crypto space and to recover if they get into trouble. If you have any questions about this video or a topic that you'd like me to cover, just leave a reply.